please. Second Samuel. Thank you. Remember me. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Brother Brian. Everyone in Second Samuel, a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb. Second Samuel chapter 15. Um, one of the darkest days in King David's life is David's own son plotted against him. Now, you know, we can take a lot of things, but your own boy going against you, that's pretty bad, isn't it? The Bible said in verse uh, 1, It came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and fifty men to run before him. Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate, and it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Oh, he said, Oh, Absalom said, Moreover, Oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh unto him to do obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Stole the hearts of the men of Israel. After David's mercy and forgiveness of his dear son, See, what happened is um, 2 Samuel chapter number 13. Um, Amon, I'm not going to go into it, but Amon, Amon uh, did a very, did very bad thing. And the, well, the Bible records it. The, he, he actually um, forced his sister's hand. And um, it was Absalom's sister. It was... Amon's sister, but by a different mother. And um, anyway, he, he fled. Absalom fled because uh, he killed Amon. He had Am Amon killed. He, he fled. And uh, David, David just never was right. So things worked out where that, where that David half-heartedly forgave him. Then, of course, David completely forgave him and allowed him allowed him back in and opened his arms up. So we see mercy and forgiveness. But Absalom could not be content with the honor of being the king's son. He wanted to be king. Couldn't be content with the position that he had. He wanted more. If, if, if Absalom had any sense of gratitude, he would have studied how to oblige his father, but on the contrary, he meditates, he sits and thinks and goes to bed and thinks about it, dreams about it, his waking moments, thinks about it, how to undermine his father by stealing the hearts of the people. And again, the Bible said over in Second Samuel chapter number 15, verse number 13, and there came a messenger to David saying, the hearts of the men of Israel are gone after Absalom. The hearts of the men of Israel are gone after Absalom. Well, Absalom's looking pretty good if you think about it. Back in chapter number 15, verse number 1, it came to pass that Abraham prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to, to uh, run before him. So he, he's looking good in the eyes of the people. He knew what he was doing. He was, a, he was devising a plan. His plan was being carried out, carried out, gratify, what he's doing, he's gratifying his own pride and the people's foolishness. Uh, if you'll go back to um, 1 Samuel chapter 27, 1 Samuel 27, 1 Samuel chapter 27, David is running from Saul and... Um, went to Gath. Went to Gath. He, he uh, stayed under King Achish there. Um, and then while he was there with King Achish, I think that's the way you pronounce his name, isn't it? Achish, verse 2. 
David arose and he passed over 600 men that were with him unto Achish, the son of Maok, king of Gath. Well, while he was there, he defeated Geshur. If you'll note, and I'm going somewhere with this, just follow along with me. Verse 8, And David and his men went up and invaded the Geshurites and the Gezrites and the Amalekites. Man, alive. if you get into all these ites, there's a whole bunch of them, aren't they, in the Old Testament. Nevertheless, for those nations were of old, the inhabitants of the land as thou goest to sure, even to the land of Egypt. David, running from Saul, fled to Achish, I mean, fled to, to Gath under King Achish. I think I got all that straight. Y'all help me out. All right, I, I'm all right. David, running from Saul, fled to Gath under King Achish. And to satisfy or to gain favor with King Achish, David defeated some cities, went back. Um, in verse 12 of that same chapter, 1 Samuel 27, And Achish believed David, saying, He hath made his people Israel utterly to abhor him. Therefore he shall be my servant forever. So David was a little deceptive there too, wasn't he? If you think about it. But nevertheless, that's what David did. And um, then in 2 Samuel chapter 3, 2 Samuel chapter 3, in verse 3. Now the Bible records back in 1 Samuel 27 that David, David defeated everyone in Geshur. But, and the Bible never contradicts itself. So, probably the, the, the majority of the army he defeated, he said defeated every, everyone that was there at that particular time. But in 2 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 3, it's talking about David's sons. His second, of course, Chiliab of Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And the third, Absalom, the son of Mekah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. So somehow or another, uh, just a little bit later, David married Absalom's mother and she was from Geshur, a place that David had destroyed. All right, now, let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 13. When Absalom killed Amon, the Bible said he fled in verse 37 of 2 Samuel chapter 13. The Bible said, But Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amahud, king of Geshur, and David mourned for his son every day. All right, so Absalom went back to his roots. He went back to his, back to his mother's family. All right, now let's go back to 2 Samuel chapter 15. 2 Samuel chapter 15. And uh, again, Absalom's looking good, and he's back from Geshur. He's back in Jerusalem. He's won the people's heart, trying to gratify his own pride. And, the, and actually, he satisfied the people's foolishness. Did you know that? Did you know that people will go after actions, and usually, I'm talking about the actions of Absalom. All you got to do is show a little, somebody a little of attention. In this case, Absalom was putting on a show. I mean, he's grabbing the people and saying, I'll judge you. And, and if you'll notice in verse number 4, Absalom said, Moreover, oh, that I were made a judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. Trying to win the favor of the people. You know what the problem is? Absalom can't even judge his own self, much less judge others. Now, you think about that, and uh, that kind of reminds you of... Uh, I just got a lesson. Here's a lesson that I'm pulling out of that particular passage, and I'm going to Matthew chapter number 7. And that's what uh, a lot of people's doing today. They're trying to judge others when they can't even judge themselves. In Matthew chapter number 7, the Bible says in verse 1, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged, and with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote 
that is in thy brother's eye, but considereth not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote of thy, out of thy brother's eye. And then it says, give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. But a lot of people are doing that. They're, they're trying to make judgment and pass judgment and when they can't even judge themselves. And that's exactly what was wrong with Absalom. In verse number 7 of 2 Samuel chapter 15, Absalom schemed for a long time. A long time. The Bible said it came to pass after 40 years that Absalom said unto the king, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed unto the Lord in Hebron. So he schemed a long, long time. It took him a long time to execute the plan. Now, what he did is he used the Lord for an excuse. How many people, have you ever done that? Don't, don't raise your hand by no means. But I wonder how many times we've used the Lord for an excuse for our own actions. Um, the Bible said in verse 8, he was telling David, he told his daddy, he said, uh, he said uh, I pray thee let me go and pay my vow. In verse 7, verse 8, for thy servant vowed a vow while I, while I abode at Geshur in Syria. See, he's getting all of his, probably getting a lot of his information back in Geshur about what he should do. It took him 40 years to, to fulfill the plan. He said, For thy servant vowed a vow while I abode at Geshur in Syria, saying, If the Lord shall bring me again indeed to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. I wonder how many, how many times that's happened in Scripture. Using the Lord uh, to cover up your own nastiness, your own sin, or your own scheme, and then blaming it on the Lord. You know, a lot of times preachers, missionaries do that. They say, uh, because they have somewhere that they want to go, and I'm getting this out of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, by the way. Bemis has forsaken me, having loved this present world. I preached a sermon on that one time, and, and I said, maybe he left because he liked what he saw in Thessalonica. Thessalonica was a wicked city. The Bible said, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Cretans to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia, so on and so forth. But he had been to Thessalonica on a missionary journey, and Thessalonica, again, was an evil city. If I could compare a city to old Thessalonica, old Salonica, it became known as Salonica, it would be somewhere like... Um, Las Vegas, San Francisco, or Pensacola during Memorial Day. Uh, I'm serious. I just want you to compare it to. Thessalonica was an evil town. Now, the Bible says, having loved this present world. And there, there's, I've heard in my lifetime, missionaries and preachers wanting to go somewhere because they liked it there. They, they, they wasn't seeking the will of God. Now, I'm not, this is very few and far between, but I have known it. I, I've known it. I've known it. They say, well, the Lord's called me and blaming, blaming something on the Lord that the Lord didn't have anything to do with. Um, turn, I'll, let me give you another illustration to confirm that. Back in Exodus, if you would. Exodus 32, I believe it is. Yeah, Exodus 32. Exodus 32, and this goes right along with what Absalom did, using the Lord to further his own agenda, to hide and cover his sin. Using the Lord to, to, to justify our wrongdoing. That's what Absalom was doing. And then the Bible says back in Exodus 32, of course, Moses went up to the mountain. He had been up there too long. And uh, he's getting the law. According to them, he had been up there too long. The Bible said... And when the people saw in Exodus 32 that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us, for as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. 
All right, they give all their gold, um, Aaron fashioned a calf. Verse 6, they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Uh, I've always asked myself when I turn to Exodus 32, and I've asked my congregation, how can a people that, that experienced the power of God, heard the, heard the voice of God, in Exodus 20, when he gave audibly the law, now they knew what the law said. They experienced the Shekinah power of the glory of God, of a day by a cloud at night by a pillar of fire. They saw the mighty hand of God work as they come out of Egypt. How could a, a people that experienced the glory and the majesty and the power of God, how could they create something that looked so unlike God? And then called it God. I'll tell you why. It's because they, they, they wanted to worship. They wanted to worship. They wanted to practice their evil, but hide it under the guise of religion. Same thing we do today. Absalom's doing the same thing people do today. He's blaming the Lord for a personal vendetta to further his own ungodly agenda and hiding it under the guise of religion. That's what he's doing. I wonder how many people at church are doing the same thing. I, I hope it's not you. Uh, back in 2 Samuel, Absalom's king, and then in verse number 9, how could David refuse such a request? David loved God. David was a man after God's own heart. David encouraged worship. David wanted people to worship God and uh, fulfill their vows. So how could David refuse? Well, it gets interesting. Verse 10, Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. And verse number 11, With Absalom went 200 men out of Jerusalem that were called and they went in their simplicity and they knew not anything. Now that word simplicity means moral innocence or upright. These 200 men that went with Absalom really didn't know anything. They had no clue of Absalom's scheme or a scheme or his or his agenda. All right, that brings me to another lesson. Uh a schemer, a schemer, now, not everyone that, that uses good things and good people is a schemer. But a schemer uses good things and good people to further his agenda. A, and you know what that is? That's, and you'll find that in every second epistle. The apostates, doesn't, they, they don't come in trying to rip everything apart. An apostate will come in the church. Uh, fact is, turn over to Second um, Peter. Let me show you something. Second Peter, chapter 2. Verse 1, are you there? The Bible said, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Among who's you? Who's you? The church. The church who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. All right, now, they didn't, they didn't come in trying to upset everybody. They came in kind of fit with the crowd, didn't they? Fit, fit with the crowd, said a few things, and then use, to further their agenda, they schemed using good things and good people. By the way, that's the mark of the Antichrist because the Bible said all of the world wondered after the beast. 
you can go to, I'm not going to go there, Revelation chapter number 13, when the, it was the Antichrist using religion to further his agenda. And when, he, when the false prophet actually created an image and set it in the holy place, when, when the Antichrist was through with the church or with, or with that professing church, what did the Antichrist do to the church? Or due to Christianity or due to those... He got rid of them. So Absalom was... Back to 2 Samuel. Absalom, there's just lessons, all kinds of lessons in here. Absalom was a schemer. Now, verse number 10, the Bible said, Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. Verse 10, the plot had been revealed, but here's the problem. Here's a problem in, in, in Old Testament times. They didn't have Facebook. Yeah. That, some of you got that, didn't you? I find out some of your condition uh, on Facebook quicker than I do somebody calling me. Isn't that something with social media? Did you ever dream in your life the, the internet would play such a practice in our communication. Anyway, the plot had been revealed. Now, and, and the plot, of course, was against David. And generally speaking, that which aims at the crown aims at the head that wears it. That, that's a schemer. That, that's, that's a schemer. That's anyone trying to undermine the authority of anyone. Well, anyway, they, they left Jerusalem. David left Jerusalem. Look at verse 13. And there came a messenger to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. And David said unto all of his servants that were with him at Jerusalem, Rise and let us flee, for we shall not else escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring evil upon us and smite the city with the edge of the sword. And the king's servant said unto the king, Behold, thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my lord the king shall appoint. And the king went forth and all of his household after him. And the king left ten women, who, uh, ten women which were concubines to keep the house. And the king went forth and all the people after him and tarried in a place that was far off. And all of his servants passed on beside him. And all the Cherethites, and all the Pelethites, and all the Gittites. Six hundred men which came after him from Gath passed on before the king. Now, they left Jerusalem, but if you'll notice who was with David, the Cherethites, that simply means the guardsmen, and the Pelethites were the couriers or the messengers. That's what that word means, Pelethites, if you look it up, and Strong's. Because I, I couldn't, I didn't really know if it was a tribe or it was a group of people. But they were with him. And then the Gittites, the Gittites simply the Philistines from Gath. Um, and the Bible said there were 600 men that went with him. Well, I couldn't understand because Gath is always been against Israel. Gath is where Goliath came from. He was a Philistine of Gath. So how did, the, the, only, the only way I can reckon this, and I know it happened, um, is that while David was in Gath when he ran from Saul, that David had gained favor and people looked at David's virtue and his piety and they embraced the Jewish religion. They saw in a man that wherever he goes, I'm going. Because he's following. Isn't that what Paul said? Follow me because I'm a follower of God, basically. Didn't Paul say, follow me? So that's what they were following David because David was a follower of God. Now, and, and, and you look at, the, look at the Pelethites and the Cherethites and the Gittites. It reminds me, here's another lesson. It reminds me of what Matthew chapter number 8 says when the Lord said concerning the Roman centurion that he had not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel. And then he also said it concerning the woman of Canaan 
great is thy faith over in Matthew chapter number 15. All right, let's go on 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse number 19. Verse number 19. Then said the king to Itai, the Gittite, part of that 600, he said, Wherefore goest thou also with us? Return to thy place and abide with the king, for thou art a stranger and also an exile. Where, whereas thou camest but yesterday, should I this day make thee go up and down with us, seeing I go whither I may, return thou and take back thy brethren, mercy and truth be with thee. And I tell you, I answered the king and said, as the Lord liveth, and as my Lord the king liveth, Surely in what place my Lord the King shall be, whether in death or life, even there also will thy servant be. And David said, unto, said to Atei, go and pass over. And Atei the Gittite passed over and all of his men and all the little ones that were with him. Now, the reason I read that is all of the opposition by his son. And then we have this 600 men that are following David. And included in that 600 men was a fellow named Atei. He was loyal to David. Though Absalom stole the hearts of the people, here is one that he couldn't steal. His name was Atei. His name means near. That's what his name means, near. And Atei was sure living up to his name. He stayed, stayed with David. He's described by his name, and he again certainly lived up to it. He was... Described by his time as well. In verse number 19, the Bible said he was a stranger. Verse number 20, and as one that came us but yesterday. Isaiah, uh, or not Isaiah, but Atea was an exile. He was born in a different kingdom, but transferred his life into a new kingdom. And... In this case, it was David's kingdom. Hold your place there and go to Ephesians 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Follow along with me, if you will. Ephesians chapter 2. A lot of scripture tonight, but it's some good lessons. Ephesians chapter 2. And let's, um, let's look here at uh, oh, verse number 11. Bible said in verse number 11, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now... In Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. In, in, um, stay in Ephesians chapter number 2 here just for a moment. But back in 2 Samuel chapter number 15 and verse number 21, this new follower of David had already willfully decided three key issues for his life. The first thing, he decided who his king was. The second thing he decided, where his allegiance belonged. And the third thing that um, he decided was to whom his life belonged. He was given the opportunity to quit by King David. But he said in verse number 21, basically, where you're to be found, that's where I'm going to be found. Where you're to be found, that's where I'm going to be found. I tell you, according to 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse number 19, was a Gittite. Born in Gath, according to verse number 18, a sworn enemy of God and God's people... Again, Goliath was from Gath. I sure hope, after I read Ephesians chapter number 2 here, I sure hope that you're making the connection here. 
with a man named Atei and with yourself, if you're a saved man. We who were strangers, Ephesians 2.12 that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. We who were strangers and exiles have been brought nigh by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, according to Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 13. You see, in verse number 23 of 2 Samuel chapter 15 the Bible said in all the country wept with a loud voice and all the people passed over the king also himself passed over the brook Kidron all the people passed over toward the way of the wilderness um, turn over to John chapter 18 John chapter number 18. John chapter number 18. Um, about a thousand years later, the Bible mentions here in John chapter number 18, in verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron, Sidron, is a Greek transliteration. Kid, same brook. Went over the brook Sidron, where was a garden into which he entered and his disciples. Now, when Jesus went over this brook Kidron, do you remember what had just happened to the Lord Jesus Christ? He was rejected. He was rejected by his brethren. He was rejected by his own family. When David crossed Kidron in 2 Samuel, he was rejected by his brethren, his country, and his own family, even his own son, rejected him. You see, we get to John chapter number 18, we find the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our greater David, if you will. And as Atei was willing to be identified with David... My question is, are you willing to be identified with the Lord Jesus Christ? And you say, I thought you said the message was on a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb. So are you willing to be identified? Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own his cause or blush? to speak his name. Are you willing to be identified with the Lord Jesus Christ? Just like Atei was willing to be identified with David. Amen. Let's stand our feet, please. We'll be dismissed. All right.